Yeah, thanks. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Dana Kolick. Um, professor Kolick is currently a professor and director of Monash Robotics at Monash University, uh, where she develops autonomous systems that can operate in concert with humans while learning from human feedback. Uh, over the last few years, Professor Kolick has worked on a, a wide range of really interesting HRI and imitation learning topics. Um, and that's my area of research, so I'm very interested, including, uh, but of course not limited to, safe control during HRI-based robot and human perception, gestural interfaces for HRI, uh, continuing, continual and lifelong learning from demonstrations and many other super awesome topics. Uh, prior to Monash, uh, Professor Kulik got a PhD from University of BC uh, in Canada, where she was postdoctoral fellow and a project assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and in 2009, she established the Adaptive System Laboratory at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so a crazy, super impressive CV. <laughs> um, thank you, Pro Professor Kirk, for offering to speak with us today on the topic of uh, learning from human-robot interaction. Please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the kind uh, introduction. And thank you to uh, uh, Raya, Alexandra, and the entire organizing team for organizing this conference, uh, especially during these uh, challenging times. Um, it's amazing that uh, some of you are able to assemble in person for the conference. I'm very sad that uh, I'm not able to join you in London, uh, but I'm uh, very honored to be here, uh, even if uh, remotely. Um, so as Jonathan mentioned, um, I work in uh, human-robot interaction. Um, so as we all know, in recent years, we have seen an explosion of research in uh, machine, uh, machine learning. And these fundamental advances have had a huge influence in many domains. Um, and learning is also a critical capability in human-robot interaction. So in this talk, uh, I hope to tell you a little bit about how we've been thinking about learning in the context of human-robot interaction, and especially about some aspects of HRI that I think are unique and pose some interesting and still unsolved problems uh, for learning. Um, so when I think about kind of what are the key challenges of HRI, the first challenge is expectations. Um, for most of us, well before we encounter a real robot, we become aware of robots through movies, books, cartoons, and other forms of fiction. And the robots of our imagination are not just capable of performing a variety of tasks, they can anticipate our wishes and cater to our every need. So when people encounter robots in real life, they often have some pretty high expectations of what robots will be able to do for them. Um, and unfortunately, often those expectations are not realized. Um, so why is this? Um, part of the problem is that our techniques for developing robot behavior come from this industrial automation background where robots operate in very carefully controlled environments, uh, where the robot's objective is always clear, uh, and every action can be pre-programmed. However, uh, humans operate in very dynamic environments, and sometimes the most dynamic thing in human environments are the humans themselves, uh, who are not always predictable. So to perform well in these human environments, robots need to become much more adaptable. They need to be able to learn the preferences and needs of the humans. Um, so I'd like to start by kind of analyzing the HRI context so we can understand what exactly uh, the challenges are and what the robot needs to learn. Um, so first of all, uh, kind of HRI is very broad. There are many possible ways that robots and humans can work together. So I'd like to first consider some possible contexts uh, that, and look at them through a couple of different lenses. So the first one that I think um, actually is gonna structure this talk as well is, and I think is very important, is to understand what's the role of the human and what's the role of the robot during the interaction. So one possibility is that we have a human teacher and a robot learner. This is very common um, uh, configuration. So here the human knows what they want the robot to do, but the challenge is kind of how to impart this to the robot. Um, and this could be through a verbal instructions, uh, it could be through demonstrations, or it could be through some kind of corrective, uh, uh, corrective feedback. Um, and so the idea here is that the a human teacher knows the objective, but needs to uh, inform the robot about this objective. And possibly the teacher could also help the robot with uh, uh, how to actually perform the task, so the policy. Uh, another role configuration could be that we have a robot teacher and a human learner. So kind of the opposite. And this is maybe not as common, 
But uh, actually, uh, one uh, very important application domain for this kind of configuration is in rehab. So in the rehab uh, setting, we might have a rehab robot that knows what the target motion profile is for the patient. Uh, and what it needs to figure out is how to help or guide the patient to get there uh, in the best way. And then the third role assignment uh, is when we have human robot peers. So the robot and the person are working together to accomplish a shared task. So an example here that I'm showing uh, in this image is something like collaborative uh, load carrying. Um, and when we have human robot peers, it could be that the robot and the human have similar skills, but we could also and more commonly have the situation where the human and the robot maybe have complementary skills. Um, and uh, when the human and the robot are working together, uh, again, uh, we can have this um, situation where uh, the, uh, perhaps the objective is already known, uh, or we need to learn the objective. Uh, or if the uh, objective is already known, do we need to learn the policy or uh, can we assume that we already uh, know the policy? Uh, and then something that's cl critical for to understand when we're trying to learn in the context of human-robot interaction is, um, you know, what do we know or what can we assume about the human partner? Um, so one question is, what's their level of expertise? Can we assume that they're the expert? Um, and they may also have kind of expertise in parts of the tasks, but not others. Um, another question is, do we have a good model? So can we predict what the human is likely to do in a given scenario? And could we maybe use that model to uh, help the robot learn in simulation before we start interacting? Um, another critical question is um, kind of what can we, uh, if the robot is going to be interacting with multiple users or multiple uh, partners, um, can we assume that what we learn about one person will transfer to another? Uh, so is it basically that we can model uh, all humans as kind of having shared commonalities uh, that we can exploit during learning? Or is it the case that uh, we think that individual characteristics dominate um, and so whatever we learn for one particular individual, we can't really easily translate to another. Uh, and it may also be possible that these characteristics might also be changing uh, over time. Um, so depending on uh, kind of what the answers are to these questions for a particular application, the type of learning approach that we use uh, might be very different. Um, so in this talk, uh, I'd like to give uh, three examples of some of our recent work uh, kind of implementing uh, robot learning in different role contexts. Um, and I'm just going to look at kind of the three configurations that um, I just outlined. So let's start with the first one, uh, where we have a human teacher and a robot learner. Um, so here our aim is to estimate the human objectives from uh, their observed actions or demonstrations. Um, so of course, this is a very active, has been a very active research area for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, uh, when we're learning from human uh, demonstrations, uh, there's generally two common approaches. One approach is to learn the policy directly. Uh, and the other approach is to learn the demonstrator's cost or reward. Um, and the idea that, uh, here is that by uh, learning this cost or reward, it, this is a kind of a more parsimonious and abstract representation of the task so that uh, aim is that then this, uh, this representation will be more generalizable to maybe if there's a different environmental context or if there's a different uh, capability of the robot compared to the human, we still have the sh same, uh, the share, a shared objective, uh, but maybe the way to achieve that objective might be different between the demonstrator uh, and the imitator. So, so common, the, the common techniques uh, here are using something like inverse optimal control uh, or inverse reinforcement learning. Um, so here's uh, an example uh, from, uh, from uh, my lab. So this is the work uh, of my uh, recent uh, PhD graduate, Vlad. Um, so what we're doing here is we want to uh, learn um, a, a demonstration. Uh, uh, in this example, uh, the um, hand, uh, handwriting data set. So what we do here is we learn the demonstrator's cost as a non-parametric model. So we learn a Gaussian process that models a time varying cost function and the variance indicates the importance of tracking the mean trajectory. And we then use that uh, learned cost function within a model predictive uh, control framework to find the optimal policy for imitating these demonstrations. 
Um, so in this video, uh, I'm showing you um, examples from the uh, LASA handwriting data set. Um, so here's uh, another example uh, using the same technique. What we can do now, the nice thing about using this within a model predictive control framework is that uh, we can then also incorporate additional constraints that uh, maybe the demonstrator didn't have. So in this example here, we have a task space constraint, but we can also easily incorporate joint space uh, as well as torque constraints, um, and then kind of uh, then generate an imitation uh, of the human demonstration that is as close as possible, but satisfies uh, all the task constraints. Now, uh, note that here, uh, as in most other learning from demonstration work, we have assumed that the demonstrator is an expert, and both the mean and the variance in the demonstration are informative about the task. So the mean tells us about the trajectory objective, while the variance tells us about the relative importance of that objective. Uh, but this uh, whole idea is based on a very big assumption, and that is that the demonstrator is an expert and that kind of all the demonstrations are, are perfect. Um, so recently, uh, uh, we've been interested in this question of well, what, do, what happens if we have demonstrators of varying expertise? Um, is it okay to assume that uh, demonstrations are generated by an expert and just proceed as before? Uh, or do we also need to kind of estimate uh, the expertise and then treat, um, treat demonstrations from uh, non-experts uh, differently? So this is work uh, with my postdoc, uh, Pamela Carino Medrano. Um, so uh, we've been investigating this uh, in the context of uh, robots in shared spaces. So uh, the example that I'm showing here is um, the case for uh, integrating mobile robots in warehouse settings. So this uh, scenario was introduced to us by our industrial collaborator, ClearPath Robotics, um, while Pamela and me were still at the University of Waterloo. Uh, so in this scenario, the robot is to be introduced into a warehouse space that is already used by human users. So we might have workers on foot, as well as human-driven vehicles such as forklifts. Uh, and so now we would like to also introduce mobile robots into this shared space. Uh, but what we would like to do is to uh, convey to the robot about expectations for the robot behavior. Um, so here's an example of a real warehouse map that's provided by our industrial partner. Uh, so to deploy an, autom uh, an autonomous uh, material transport robot in such an environment, uh, first of all, the robot is given the map of this environment, either from CAD or by teleoperating the robot and using the robot's onboard measurements to generate a map. Once we have the map, uh, the human operator then must specify some additional constraints on the robot behavior. So the human operator would obviously specify the start and goal position, so where the material is picked up and dropped off. Uh, the operator might also specify some no-go or avoidance zones, uh, zones where speed should be reduced. And there might already be roads specified for forklifts to follow, and it would obviously be desirable if the robot was also following those same road rules. Now, these constraints may have different levels of importance. Um, so uh, maybe some of the no-go zones are absolutely critical that you don't go there, but maybe for some of them, it's more like an avoidance zone and it's preferable if the robot doesn't go there, but if, uh, if the resulting path would be way longer, maybe it would be okay to cut, uh, cut across some of those zones. So what we would like to learn uh, is kind of what is the relative importance of these constraints? Uh, and we can learn that from observing uh, human drivers traversing the environment. Um, so this could be either uh, the humans that are driving the, the forklifts, or it could be from teleoperating the robot. So from these observations, uh, we would like to determine, first of all, the relative importance of the constraints, uh, but also, is there any influence uh, if we have different expertise uh, levels of the demonstrator? Um, so... Uh, we can answer this question of, you know, does the expertise of the demonstrator matter? Uh, first of all, in simulation. Uh, so we can generate arbitrary environments and demonstrations of simulated users with varying levels of expertise. And then we can try to estimate either uh, the simulated user's reward and expertise simultaneously, or just the reward, assuming that the user's expertise is known. And then we evaluate the performance uh, by considering the regret uh, for policies obtained from the true versus the predictive preferences. 
so what we can see in this, so this is all simulation results here where we know what the true expertise and the true reward, uh, the, the true uh, preferences of the simulated user are. Uh, and what we can see from the simulation is that if we uh, obtain preference estimates uh, using incorrect assumptions of expertise, we get regret metrics that are approximately two orders of magnitude larger than regret metrics obtained when we use joint inference. So actually considering the user as user's expertise explicitly is important because the, uh, the preferences estimated if we don't consider expertise are actually incorrect. So we also wanted to test this with real human data. Um, so here we used an existing data set where users were given a sample warehouse environment and asked to provide a specification. Uh, to spec so they specified the roads, the no-go zones, and so on. And then they were asked to teleoperate a robot from one of the starting points to one of the ending uh, points uh, with a joystick. Uh, and this was in uh, a simulation environment. Uh, so here we have users that are highly knowledgeable about the task. So they know exactly what the specification is because they just generated that themselves. Uh, but may have varying skill at actually operating the, te the robot teleoperation interface. And here we have only one uh, demonstration trajectory. Uh, so here is uh, uh, an example. So we use the proposed approach to simultaneously recover the demonstrator's cost uh, function as well as their expertise. And then we use the recovered cost function to generate what would be the optimal trajectory uh, of that cost function. So here is an example for a demonstrator that was estimated to be an expert. So on the left, uh, what you see is the participant specification and their demonstration. So the red areas indicate the no-go zones that the user indicated. Uh, green are the roads that the user indicated. And then the blue is their demonstration trajectory. So we can see that this uh, participant uh, is able to drive fairly straight. They have a few minor deviation from a straight line path, but they mostly followed their own road network specification and avoided the central no-go zone. On the right, you see the same participant specification and the path generated using the recovered cost function. So we can see that the recovered path is very similar to the demonstration and it's just removing those small jitters. So here is an example for a demonstrator that was estimated to be a novice. So what we can see here is that they had considerable difficulty driving straight, especially in the open area. Uh, and when we recover uh, the underlying cost function, uh, assuming uh, and, uh, and estimate that they're a novice, uh, then the recovered optimal path removes this uh, drifting. So um, to summarize, uh, assuming expert demonstrations uh, can lead to incorrect reward recovery if the demonstrator is not an expert. Um, so if expertise is unknown, it's probably better to use joint inference. However, when we're using joint inference, now the inference problem is much harder, uh, and especially it's more challenging to estimate novices. Um, and another kind of important factor here is, uh, well, what do you assume if somebody is a uh, novice demonstrator and they're not giving an optimal demonstration, what do you assume about that non-optimality? Um, so most uh, works, including this one, we're just assuming that it's some kind of random deviation, but this may not be a good assumption because actually there might be um, a, a systematic bias uh, in, uh, uh, in how the demonstrations are suboptimal. Okay, uh, I next wanna jump uh, topics and look at this second role configuration uh, where we have uh, a robot teacher and a human learner. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this is a common configuration in rehabilitation and assistive system. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, this uh, uh, question of uh, how we can learn to provide feedback during gait rehab, particularly uh, looking at Parkinson's disease. So PD is a progressive neurological disorder that uh, results in motor disturbances. And one of the a common motor disturbance is known as freezing of gait. Uh, so you can see a very nice uh, example uh, video um, uh, uh, on this side, on the left, uh, showing uh, a patient who is suffering from freezing of gait. So you can see that they're basically stopping and they're making these very small uh, steps. Um, and these videos are courtesy uh, of Dr. Murphy at the Monash Health Movement Disorder Clinic. Uh, so it turns out that uh, during gait rehab, this uh, freezing of gait symptoms can be alleviated by providing cues on where or when to step. 
And so what you see in the video uh, on the right uh, is uh, visual cues. So there are visual cues on the floor and uh, uh, the patient is told to try to step on onto the line. And as you can see, this uh, results uh, in uh, much more, um, much larger steps. Uh, and the other interesting thing to note here is that this persists, the uh, larger step size persists for some time, even after the cue is removed. Um, so uh, what I've shown you here uh, in the video on the previous slide is visual cues, uh, but it turns out that cues can be visual or auditory or haptic. Um, so visual cues provide spatial information, whereas auditory cues provide temporal information, and both can be helpful for generating uh, improved gait. Um, however, most existing approaches generate a fixed on-demand queuing strategy. So basically kind of there's two parts. One is to figure out, is queuing needed? And then once you figure out that queuing is needed, you just provide a fixed strategy. So that's exactly what we saw in the visual queuing case. Uh, but what we would like to do is to generate cues that are only provided when needed uh, to help avoid habituation um, and also personalized to the user. To, so basically we wanna be able to get the user to the target gate profile as quickly as possible. Um, and so what we wanna do is develop an approach to online optimization for queuing. Um, and there is a, a really nice line of related work of doing human in the loop optimization for gate rehab uh, for other applications, uh, not for PD. Um, and we think that uh, uh, in-the-loop optimization is very important, uh, especially for this application, because patients' characteristics are uh, and response to cues are very individualized and also are likely to change even for the same patient over time, uh, because it's very dependent uh, on kind of their, the current, uh, where they are uh, in their medication uh, cycle. Um, so here is an overview of the proposed approach. Uh, we have a um, human walker and we measure their gait with an IMU that's uh, located just above the knee. And we can also provide them with a cue to correct their gait. So this could be uh, spatial or auditory uh, or haptic. In this case, uh, we're looking at auditory. Um, now from the IMU measurement, uh, we estimate the human gait parameters. So things like the step size and the cadence. Uh, and then uh, given th those uh, estimated gate parameters and the cues that we've provided, what we would like to learn is a model of how the cue influences the resulting gate profile. And then given that model, uh, we want to uh, optimize uh, the next cue. Uh, so to generate the cue that will get us to the target state the fastest. Uh, and what we would like to do is to run this entire loop online so that we can adapt to each individual user as well as to any changes in their responsiveness over time. And so what we would like is for this learning to be happening quite fast. Um, so let me just um, show you some examples. So we use a very simple gate model, just a periodic, uh, 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 so we assume that the gate is periodic. So we model it as a weighted sum of sinusoids. And then we learn these uh, sinusoid weights uh, and frequencies with incremental updates. Um, and uh, what you can see in the graphs here is that this learning happens very fast because it's a very simple model with few parameters. So even within um, you know, five to 10 steps, uh, we can uh, get a very good estimate of, uh, 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 of the uh, step and the, and the cadence. Uh, and then we use a Gaussian process to learn the mapping between the input Q frequency and the resulting cadence. Uh, and then we use that GP model to then optimize the generation of the next Q. So when we start, uh, we basically start from scratch. And so we have, uh, we have no knowledge of how the, uh, how the person responds to cues at the beginning. Uh, and so as a result, there is this kind of two phase behavior during learning. There's the first phase, which is kind of the exploratory phase where uh, different cues are generated. So you can see kind of cues uh, start, uh, uh, there's kind of a jump, the cues are jumping up and down. Uh, the cues are these uh, blue dots. Um, and then once there is, uh, once a model has been learned, uh, then we start generating cues that are kind of in the converged phase that are based on uh, the learned model. Uh, and so uh, in, in general, this learning happens fairly quickly. Uh, so here uh, we can uh, see convergence after about uh, 70 seconds uh, of data that has been obtained. 
Um, so we tested this in an experiment uh, with uh, 25 healthy participants. Uh, so what we asked them to do is uh, to basically walk uh, in a large empty room while their gait was measured. Uh, and this is the um, sequence of uh, conditions that they followed. So we started uh, with just a short practice, just so that they could get familiar with um, uh, wearing the IMU and listening to the cues. Uh, and then we asked them to walk for six minutes with no cue, just at their natural pace. And we used this uh, baseline uh, time to measure their preferred cadence. Uh, then what we do is to try to cue them to either increase or decrease their preferred cadence by 20%. So either up or down. And we try to change their cadence using three different queuing strategies. The first one is the fixed cue. So this is kind of the standard approach. So we provide a constant beat at the target uh, pace. Uh, the second one is a proportional cue, where we provide a cue frequency that's proportional to their error, so the difference between their actual pace and the target pace. And then the adaptive cue, which is the proposed approach. Um, and then following, uh, so we randomize these conditions. So there is um, six conditions, three for up and three for down. They're presented in random order. Uh, and then after each condition, we, uh, we give them uh, a subjective uh, survey. Uh, and then at the end of the experiment, uh, there is a debrief. Uh, so I'll show you a brief summary uh, of the results. So first we look at the mean absolute error between the target cadence and the actual cadence. Uh, and I'm showing those separately for the up and down targets. So here we are comparing the fixed in blue, the proportional in pink, uh, and the adaptive strategy in yellow. Uh, and for the adaptive strategy, I'm showing the exploration phase and the converged phase separately. So what we can see is that for both the up and down conditions, after convergence, the adaptive strategy achieves the lowest error. And also, uh, if we look at the percent on time, the percent of the time that the queuing is on, with the adaptive strategy, we have the lowest percent on time. Um, so uh, to summarize, the adaptive approach has the highest uh, error during exploration, but the lowest after convergence. Uh, the other very interesting thing uh, is that when we looked at the models and the cues that were provided, they were very different between the participants, uh, between participants. And that's because actually the participants' responsiveness to cues was very different. Um, so some individuals were very responsive. It was enough to just give them a couple of quick beats, and then they would just immediately go to the new cadence. But other people were very unresponsive, uh, and there was a lot more cueing was required uh, to move them to the target uh, pace. Um, so actually having an individualized strategy was useful, even for healthy participants. Uh, when we looked at the subjective responses, we found that uh, there was a much higher uh, cognitive load with the adaptive strategy. Um, so we, we thought maybe this might not be such a good thing, but actually speaking with our clinical collaborators, they actually thought that this might be helpful because it would help to bring attention uh, of the user to the task um, and uh, avoid uh, and reduce uh, habituation. Okay, so uh, now I want to uh, uh, end with the third uh, type of uh, uh, role assignment in human-robot interaction, and that's looking at human-robot peers. Uh, and here, the uh, application uh, that uh, I'd like to talk about is drone co-piloting. Um, so the idea here is that, uh, uh, so uh, here we're looking at collaborative task execution where the human and the robot might have different knowledge and capabilities. So with drone piloting, drone piloting is a very cognitively demanding and difficult skill to learn. Uh, it involves perception, uh, le learning the dynamic model of the vehicle, and then also manual dexterity to operate uh, the, uh, uh, the joystick interface. And so if we think about a novice human pilot, they know exactly where they want to land, uh, you know, if they understand kind of the task, but they may not know how to command the drone to do so. Um, so I'll show you um, a video uh, here just to kind of uh, illustrate the difficulty of the task. So what you can see in the inset is the pilot's view. Um, uh, and then you see also uh, the task from the side view. So you can see that this is, there is quite a, quite a perceptual challenge from the pilot's view to generate good, def uh, 
depth perception instrument to know exactly where to uh, land the drone. Um, and so what we would like to do is to develop a shared autonomy framework that provides assistance to novel pilots uh, during landing. Um, and the other thing that I'll uh, mention here is that uh, this, uh, a lot of this research was conducted uh, during uh, lockdowns uh, here in Melbourne where we didn't have access to our lab. So this is actually my student Cal's garage. Uh, so he was doing a lot of this development uh, of this work uh, in his own, uh, <laughs> in his in his home lab, uh, in in his garage. Um, so um, let me show you uh, how uh, we implement uh, this. So what uh, we would like to do is basically to learn how to assist the pilot uh, while we have a kind of shared control between the pilot and um, uh, and the robot uh, during uh, during flight. So you can imagine this is kind of like a very high pressure task because if uh, either the pilot uh, or uh, the automated systems do something wrong, we can basically crash the drone. Um, so uh, here is our proposed approach. So first of all, we want to learn a low dimensional representation of the scene as observed by the drone. And this is to help us to speed up policy learning. Um, so here we use a, uh, a variational autoencoder where the input is a camera image and the output is a depth map and the relative pose of the closest landing pad. Um, so this is learned separately uh, using, um, uh, using a, a, a simulator environment. Uh, and then uh, the next thing that we want to learn is we want to learn this collaborative flying policy. Uh, so the input here is uh, our abstracted scene, the dynamics of the drone, uh, the user action, uh, and also the previous assistant action. Uh, and here we uh, are learning this as a um, reinforcement learning uh, using the distance between uh, the landing location and the center of the goal platform as the reward. And we train this policy uh, completely in simulation using AirSim. Now, obviously, for this training to work, we need to provide some kind of user inputs. So we use a parametrized model of the user. So basically, we simulate users, we, and we simulate uh, users of different skill and different levels of agreeableness. So basically, how much they are uh, willing to be, uh, you know, uh, to follow the suggestion of, of the co-pilot. Uh, and so then we have the output uh, basically the action that should be uh, taken by the drone. And what we do is we average the action that is uh, provided by uh, the learner and the action that was provided by the user. And we just uh, average them together and then provide them as input to the flight controller. So uh, when we test this idea, uh, first of all, in simulation, so this is just with simulated users. Uh, we, uh, so what we see here, um, on the vertical axis is the landing error, so the distance between uh, where the drone landed and where the target was. And then on the horizontal axis, we have the expertise of the simulated user. And so what we see here, um, kind of as we expect, is that as we increase the expertise of the uh, simulated user, the landing error decreases. But you can see that our simulated users are not too skilled because the error is still pretty high. And then when we assist these simulated users, uh, the uh, performance is much better. But of course, this is a uh, simulation, so everything works re really nicely. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is now try this with real uh, users. Um, so uh, because we were doing this uh, during COVID, we actually ran the user study in the simulator. So here, users are piloting a drone, but the, they're not piloting a physical drone. They're doing it in an online simulator and all using the same environment. So we had 33 participants, and each participant was asked to perform 16 landings, uh, and the location of the landing was selected randomly, both assisted and unassisted. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we asked them a questionnaire about, uh, you know, did they have any previous uh, piloting or drone or gaming experience, and then their perception of the two modes uh, and the usability. So let's look first at the uh, landing error results. So here uh, we're looking at the landing error uh, comparison between unassisted and assisted flights. So what we can see is that the error and the variance are the highest when the users are unassisted. So this is kind of good news for us. But it's important to notice that when we are assisted, we have this uh, bimodal distribution of the error. 
And this is because the learner has to learn two things. The first thing is to how to infer the target landing location of the user. So basically it's learning the objective of the user, how to infer the objective of the user. And then the second thing is once you know the objective, you know, how, do you, how to land the drone uh, uh, once, uh, once the landing target is known. So that's learning the policy. Um, and so this top mode occurs when the learner incorrectly identifies the platform. Uh, if we consider landing to any plat to the nearest platform, uh, then we can isolate just the performance of the learner on only the policy part. So we can see that uh, the assistant uh, assistant uh, helps successfully land a drone to a target platform, uh, to a platform, but it may not always uh, accurately estimate what the target platform was. Uh, so here are some uh, example trajectories of various participants performing. Uh, the same landing while either unassisted, so that's in blue, and assisted in green. Uh, so uh, the goal platform here uh, is uh, denoted in red. So in example A, we have an unexperienced uh, pilot. So you can see here the goal platform is red, but they have actually, uh, you know, because of poor depth perception, they've, they're actually going to a completely wrong platform. Um, then uh, in uh, row B, we have an intermediate platform. So you can see they're getting better and more confident, but still not perfect uh, depth perception. Uh, in C, we have an expert. So we can see now they're getting much closer uh, to the target. And basically what the assistance is doing is just making small adjustment. And then at the bottom, we see a failure case for the assistant. So you can see here that Basically, this, uh, uh, this user is kind of hovering between two platforms, so it's hard to estimate where the target is. Um, the target was actually uh, the red platform, uh, and in this case, the, uh, the co-pilot guessed incorrectly uh, and went for the black platform. Now, here are the results uh, looking at uh, broken down by expertise. So again, here on the horizontal axis, we have the participant skill level. Um, and uh, the vertical axis is the uh, landing error. Um, and what you can see is the difference between uh, the uh, unassisted and the assisted landings. Uh, and so what you can see here very nicely is um, that uh, we uh, basically uh, improve for even the most skilled pilots, we still help them improve their performance with assistance. Uh, and uh, also we can uh, basically remove the influence uh, of expertise on performance uh, by providing uh, this assistance. Uh, so uh, with this shared autonomy approach, we allow novice pilots to land a drone on their desired platform. Uh, and uh, while assisted, novices achieved greater proficiency than experienced pilots without any training. So that was super, uh, super exciting to see. Um, and this policy was learned entirely offline uh, by training in simulation with a parametrized user model. Um, so, um, so far we have done this uh, uh, only in uh, simulation, but we are currently working on a physical study. Um, and so actually what I would like to show you is like hot off the presses. So we were just allowed to go into the lab last week and we have some very uh, early results. Uh, so here is this experiment with, um, so what I'll show you here first is an expert pilot who is uh, landing, trying to land uh, unassisted. I'm gonna turn off the sound because it's quite annoying. Uh, so you can see here, this is an expert pilot. Uh, so uh, they, are, they will be able to um, uh, land this drone successfully. Uh, you can see there is still a little bit of um, back and forth as they're, uh, Uh, as they're uh, flying. And then you can see this is the um, assisted. And so the main difference uh, here is just that the uh, landing is a little bit faster uh, with assistance, but uh, the expert can land successfully assisted or unassisted. Um, now the most, the more interesting and uh, scary experiments are when we have a novice pilot uh, so here is a novice trying to land uh, unassisted. Uh, so you'll see even during the approach, they are a lot more tentative and there is kind of some back and forth. Um, 
And then uh, also once they uh, try to land again here, the challenge is this depth perception is so figuring out um, uh, how to uh, localize the drone exactly over the platform. Uh, so you can see here the pilot, uh, they're being very careful because they don't want to uh, crash, uh, crash the drone. Um, but unfortunately, their depth perception is a little bit off, uh, resulting uh, in a crash. Um, and then here is that same novice uh, to that same target, but now with the assistance. Uh, and you can see that uh, both the approach um, and the landing uh, are much smoother, uh, faster, uh, and uh, more accurate. Um, so as you can see, we are uh, currently uh, deploying this uh, with uh, in physical experiments. Uh, and what we would like to do, not just for this work, but also uh, the uh, other uh, examples that I gave is especially the rehab work to, is to test with target populations. Um, so some of the things that we're thinking about for next steps uh, is, uh, you know, so I've, I've shown you some examples here of, uh, of uh, learning that's happening online during interaction uh, and then offline uh, using uh, models uh, or simulations. Um, and so we're still thinking about, you know, for each of these different contexts, where can we use offline learning and where do we have to use online learning? Uh, and then the other thing that uh, we're really interested in is, um, okay, so we have this human and uh, robot learner working together. Um, what information should be shared between the learner uh, and, uh, and the user? Uh, and could actually sharing information be helpful uh, for both improving the learning and also improving uh, the usability uh, uh, of the interaction? Uh, so I'd like to uh, end by thanking all of my students, uh, collaborators, and sponsors. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Awesome talk, awesome results. Um, yeah, so I, let's open up to some questions. We have one already over the feed loop and I, anyone who's attending virtually, yeah, please post questions there. Um, Eric can probably see the, the questions in the audience. Um, I can start with the virtual question. Um, this is uh, from Michael at DeepMind. Uh, question for when it's time. It looked like the users used keyboard keys as inputs, which are binary, as opposed to analog inputs like joysticks, which makes flying quite difficult. Is the policy also constrained to providing binary inputs? Uh, yeah. So in the simul in the online study, they did use um, uh, they did use the binary uh, uh, key inputs. But now in this more recent work that we're doing with the physical system, uh, they are providing continuous inputs through a joystick. Uh, we have a question here in the audience. Yeah. Hi, Dana. Um, so in the second study, I was looking at the, um, the box plot that you showed. I was interested in the comparison between the fixed and the converged uh, solution. I'm just going to repeat the question. Um, in the mm -hmm. study, uh, in the previous slides, uh, the, uh, the questioner wanted to look at the difference between the fixed and the converged so solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just... Uh if I can go back to that slide. Give me a second. Too far. Ah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Leaning on the uh, arrow a bit. Well, I'll go on with the question. So the, the thing is that yeah. in the in the error, it seems that so you said that the uh, the me, uh, the median or the mean was lower after they converged, but from the box load, they were, they were looking like very, I don't know, statistically very similar. I don't know if you did the test to see if they were different, um, but I was thinking if it was, if this result was suggesting that actually um, the fixed strategy is, can be, pref I mean, perform similarly to the converge, or not. Yeah, so, so so there was a statistically uh, there was a, a, dif a statistically significant difference uh, between uh, between the two. But you're uh, you're right that the uh, fixed strategy uh, you know compare between the, the the fixed strategy was the second best, uh, and it was definitely better than the proportional strategy or 
uh, the adaptive strategy pre-convergence. Um, uh, so do one of the, do you think this yeah. is because since it's fixed, it is more, it is easier to predict. So it's more predictable. And so the user gets like, they have a good performance that is similar to the converge. Like how, how long does it take to converge? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so it's actually, so so uh, the, the convergence uh, on average was about 60 to 70 seconds. Um, and remember the participants were walking for six minutes. Um, so what would, um, what would happen is that, so the convergence was for uh, learning the model. It was not for the user converging uh, to, uh, to a steady state gate because users actually never did converge. Like users would tend to, if the queue is removed, users tend to slowly revert to their preferred, uh, preferred gate speed. So you have to keep applying um, the queue, um, you know, intermittently to remind them to go back to, because obviously we're, we're pushing them either to walk 20% faster than they would like to or 20% lower than they would like to. So it's definitely not their preferred gate speed. Um, and so you, you have to continue queuing them. So, so one of the, uh, you know, with, uh, in speaking with our, um, a clinical collaborator, uh, one of the reasons that they think that uh, their improvements could be made upon the fixed strategy is that the fixed strategy is very effective initially, but users habituate to it, uh, and then it becomes less effective. So actually, this idea that it's predictable, you're absolutely right. Initially, it works better, uh, but it may, not, um, it may not continue to work as well uh, over extended periods of time. Do we have any other questions in the audience? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So I think one of the open challenges in HRI research is uh, accurate evaluation, uh, in, especially in the real world with real humans. And this also makes iteration difficult. Often having a simulated environment makes things easier to test as your research has showed. Um, for people who are interested in getting into the field, What's like a recommended workflow for iterating on uh, evaluation setups? Do you um, start with a simulated kind of interface first and then move to real world user studies? Or do you like uh, just go directly to user studies? I'm wondering if you have a, a sort of workflow prescription for that. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, and I think even just over the last, uh, you know, two years, our workflow has changed quite substantially. <laughs> uh, we have been using a lot more uh, simulated studies and a lot more online studies than we might have done in the past. Um, so um, I, I think um, it, 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 it can depend on, uh, you know, how easy it is to set up the study um, and how easy it is to recruit participants. Um, you know, so I, I, I generally prefer to start working with real users um, as early as possible, uh, but you know it may that may not be uh, that may not be feasible. And you know, especially if you're dealing with patient populations, then um, generally the kind of accepted practice is to always start with healthy participants first, uh, and then move to uh, to a patient group afterwards. Thank you. Are there any other questions on um, virtual? I don't think so. I don't see any. Um... If no other questions, I actually have one too. <laughs> um, Go for it. Yeah, so I think a, a theme that kept coming up a couple of times in your talk was that modeling user skill is really important, um, either in sort of inferring rewards or training policies. Um, you also mentioned that like you know, simple models of, of human of user skill is it probably doesn't represent some of the systematic bias that you see. I was wondering, do you have any like concrete examples of what this sort of like more complicated bias might look like in and a follow-up would be, you know, do you know of any systems that is kind of tackling this open question of like how to model it and how to kind of think about it? Um, yeah, so, so there, are, there, are, there is some recent work, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, work from uh, Dorsa Sadig and uh, her group about uh, kind of uh, different, looking at, di you know, different models of users um, and, uh, you know, are they uh, appropriate for, uh, you know, kind of what, what models of users are best for, uh, for training policies, where they look at kind of different, you know, um, you know, di different uh, models that can be used to explain uh, uh, user behavior. 
Um, so I, I think that's that's one um, one uh, kind of vein of work that uh, uh, that I'm familiar with. Um, I think that uh, you know this question of systematic bias. Um, it's definitely something that we've noticed in um, you know some of the tasks. For example, this idea of teleoperating a mobile robot. Uh, you know, basically where people have problems is when they don't understand the friction. Uh, you know, the friction behavior, um, and then it's like a very systematic. Uh, you know, it's not just random. It's that. You know, the robot is turning when they're not expecting it to turn and they're systematically, uh, you know, you kind of get this, um, you know, it's, it's not random, it's not just random uh, inputs. Um, so we've definitely noticed that it's, you know, like a, just a, um, a random deviation from the optimal policy is not the right model, but I don't know that there is, you know, I think it really depends on the particular task. Um, and it's, uh, it's not, at least I'm not familiar of like another model that could be, uh, task independent that could explain this kind of systematic bias. Um, and the same thing with the with the piloting task. Like we know that for that this task, like the issue is often this depth perception challenge. Um, so, uh, but again, kind of, you know, so we can come up with a nice model for that for this particular task, uh, but um, it's not one that we could then extend to uh, some other task. No, that makes sense. Yeah, the, I guess the failure modes are going to be different for different applications. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, any other questions in the audience? I guess we're almost at time. We have one question back here. Um, I was curious when you were talking about the cognitive load for the gate project, um, it, sort of what kinds of questions you were asking to measure that, and also whether you have any concerns about um, sort of like the willingness of the uh, patient population to use a system, even if you're getting better performance, if it's something that requires like a very um, like high level of attention or, you know, something that's difficult for them to use. Oh, that's a really, uh, that's a really good question. So we used uh, like the NASA TLX um, to uh, estimate the cognitive, uh, cognitive load. And what we found um, was that the cognitive load was higher for the um, adaptive system. And we also did a debrief where we kind of had a structured interview with each participant um, and it very much kind of tapping it in what um, uh, Serena was mentioning earlier is that this idea of unpredictability. So the way that we, we structured this study um, is that you know the participants did not know ahead of time what the you know what they were being queued to, right? So it was the order was randomized. Um, so when they started receiving the cues, um, you know they didn't know what like what, what they were being uh, driven to. So part of the reason why participants uh, a reported higher cognitive load is because often they were kind of like, what is this, you know, especially when they got these cues that were kind of up and then down, they were kind of like, what is this thing trying to cue me to do? Um, so they found it kind of confusing and frustrating. Um, so I think um, uh, with, um, wh whereas the fixed, the fixed strategy, it's just, you know, it's very simple because it's just giving you a fixed beat. So you immediately know what, what, uh, 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 what you're supposed to be supposed to be doing. Um, now, of course, when we um, run this with patients, um, we, um, uh, you know, like we, we might provide them with more information about what the system is doing to make it easier, um, you know, for them to, uh, to use the system. And this is kind of one of the things that I mentioned, um, you know, it's kind of like when the system is learning, what additional information should it be providing uh, to the user? Uh, now we have also, uh, we are working with a clinical collaborator and we've been hoping to run this um, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease um, population. Uh, we haven't been able to do so because of the COVID restrictions, but we have actually been interviewing, uh, interviewing uh, these users to kind of better understand their, uh, uh, their um, needs and, um, uh, and their preferences for this kind of system. Um, so of course this population is quite diverse, um, but some of the people that we are talking to are quite, they're quite motivated to maintain their gait um, and to, um, you know, be able to um, uh, continue to, you know, because obviously being able to uh, have mobility is very important to, for independence and um, maintaining quality of life. Um, so um, 
I think some of them are quite, um, you know, are quite keen and motivated to use something that would help them uh, to be able to maintain their gate, especially something like that provides queuing in a kind of non-obtrusive way. So maybe whether audio or, or haptic uh, that they can use even outside of, um, uh, outside of, a, of the rehab clinic environment. Thank you very much, Dana, and to all the questioners.